So the information that we typically give uh, a young couple that wants to get married and teach about marriage in general is mostly wrong. Now, there is some truth to the kind of age-old caveat advice that you can't live on love, you're going to have to pay the bills. Well, that's true. But in terms of the things we typically ask people when it comes to getting married is we're asking the wrong questions. Like, how do you know you're ready to get married? You're never going to be ready. You're, how do you know? You, you can't be ready for something that you have no experience in. You're going to have to mature. So there's other things to look at. Um, you know, I know that we have taught in the church for a long time. The most important thing is the equally yoked. Are they a Christian? In today's culture, we have to back up one step prior. Are they even the right gender? Are they the opposite gender of you? If you're a man, is she a biological woman? If you are a woman, is he a biological man? You ask that question. Then you ask, are they a Christian? Do they have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, are you going to have the same views on everything? Very, very unlikely. It's very unlikely, especially in today's culture. People may have grown up in church. They're going to have different family experiences, all of that. But we have taught people to ask the wrong questions. Like, how do you know they're the one? Well, they said yes. You like being with them. You're attracted to them. Uh, that is a very important factor for a guy, by the way. All psychology will even tell you that. But we are putting burdens and preconditions upon people for marriage that's just wrong. Like, you're too young to get married. Uh, we tell people that all the time. You you need to be able to do this or to live your dreams or have the career that you want or you need to be able to... Um, you need to be able to know that you're ready to have kids. You're never going to be ready to have a child. You're, you're going to mature. You're never going to know everything you need to know. You're never going to be ready to be married. You're going to have fear. What we have to teach people, again, is the intrinsic beauty of what the gospel and the Bible from the very foundations teaches us. God institutes marriage because aloneness is not good because community is important, because having a relationship that you enter into on the basis of your wills that, that supersedes your very commitment to your own parents and your own family that you have grown up with. A man leaves his father and mother, he's united to his wife, and you know, the same thing applies to the woman. You, you leave the family you've had to establish a new family to have a unified relationship with another person of oneness, of doing life together until death do you part, what God has joined together, let man not separate. We have overcomplicated the ideas of marriage, and we have done so in the church. And I'm going to put the blame on the church here for a second, and I mean Christianity across the United States and Western culture largely. We have taught young people that they need to put their purpose and their desires and their happy life above their marriage and above their spouse. That the purpose of life is supremely being happy, not about serving others and living in a surrendered life to God. Now, that's what the Bible teaches. You are a great leader if you are the servant of all. You will be a good spouse if you love sacrificially and serve the person that you have committed your life to, um, to be your other half, so to speak. Now, are you a complete person with that other person? Yes, you're complete in Christ. And there's a whole lot of, you know, we, we use the term, they complete you. But the, the truth is that you do want somebody comparable to you. you. You are going to be a more holistic and unified team together than you can ever be on yourself. We have taught individualism that career trumps family, that your dreams trump uh, having children, that your lifestyle and your happiness is more important than doing the right thing and going through difficulty. We have not taught people in the church to suffer well. We have neglected lament. We have neglected the Psalms. We have neglected teaching people that spiritual life is about more than entertainment, the youth group culture, and the... the um, kidification, I could say, of our faith, the lack of maturity, the childishness. Now, we need childlike faith. That's a state of dependence upon God the Father, but we are never called to be childish. 
1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about in the midst of all the church turmoil and all the problems going on in Corinth that was celebrating how tolerant they were and how much they tolerated sexual morality in the church and how open-minded they were. And, you know, look at how loving we are. That's the very thing we see in the church today in the progressive Christian movement of let's just love people. Well, yes, we are always called to love, but the truth alone can set you free. Jesus is the truth, the way, the life. God's grace is how we receive and appropriate and are empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in his truth. God's grace is not an excuse for not speaking truth. We are so afraid to take a stand and we have taught, sadly, the, the entertainment culture of the youth group movement, youth group culture and the kidification of our faith, the childishness of our faith that we have taught for about 150 years, at least 100, um, and we have taught people to stay immature rather than pressing on to maturity, rather than becoming adults. Everybody does theology. The question is whether they're good theologians or not. Every pastor and his leadership decisions and his family life and his all of that, it matters. It's not just about how good someone's heart is and what their intentions are. That is a flawed view of humanism. What I am thankful for is that there are still bastions of freedom where people understand you have to sacrifice for what's right. You have to teach children to stand alone on, as I just read it recently, on the side of what is right. That is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. That is what Daniel did. That is what David did. You do the right thing because God says it's right, not because it's popular, not because it's going to necessarily give you an easier life. You live according to the revealed will of God, and you sacrifice for the people that are entrusted to you, for the relationships that matter, and you guard that. So when it comes to marriage advice, we need to approach it with biblical faith rather than pop psychology and a whole lot of unhelpful answers. We need to go back to the one that created marriage and created the mind and created life and created relationships, God, and look at his instructions, which tend to be fairly simple. They're just not easy. And the big problem is most of us are looking for something that's easier and something we like, even in regards to how we live out our faith, rather than being willing to do the hard work of growing up and maturing and loving someone that's an imperfect sinner but has been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and committing to partner with them. It's about a covenant. Not a contract of as long as you keep me happy will I stay in this, but a covenant. And it's time that we viewed our church membership as a covenant that we take as seriously as we do entering into the covenant of marriage. It's time that we redeem the covenantal aspect of our relationship with God and our view of our relationship with the Lord and get back to a firm, grounded theology and mature in our thinking. And it's time that we get back to a covenantal view of marriage. We have to reject these theories of well-intentioned men that are sincere but are sincerely wrong and have led our churches astray for a very long time and they've created a brand of Christianity that's foreign to the Bible. They have taught a grace that excuses sin and excuses a call to live in the holiness that God's Word demands. And they have taught that relationships and a relationship with God is an add-on rather than exclusive commitment that you willingly give up your freedoms for the sake of others and that true freedom is fighting for what matters, thinking generationally ahead of you of the impact this has upon the coming generations and thinking with a faithfulness view of the fact that I want to stand before God and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, not, oh, Ryan, you lived a great life, you were able to have everything you wanted, no, the supreme question of life is, did I honor Christ and obey him? Those who love me will keep my commandments. Jesus said, John 14, 15.